Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to this course on transition and turbulence AE625. Uh, you can get my uh, name and affiliation contacts uh, given here. Uh, I would uh, prefer uh, that you can uh, come any time that you wish to and just give me a phone call and just walk in. <coughs> uh, the title itself would uh, suggest that we are uh, looking at uh, fluid flow transition, uh, the instabilities that lead the flow to turbulent state, that is what is the main theme of this course. Uh, as we uh, begin today, uh, let me try to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the scope uh, of the course, the contents. Uh, we will start off with um, the introduction on instability and transition, that is what uh, we will begin today itself. <coughs> uh, we need to really uh, look at how the way uh, the subject has developed over the period. Um, it was quite uh, early on understood uh, that uh, actual fluid flow behavior uh, depends on flow instability. Uh, that means what? that you have governing equations of motion and those equations of motions are most of the time nonlinear partial differential equations are not solvable. Uh, in some specific cases, you could solve them and once you solve them, you would notice that, uh, that you, you get some analytic solution and you go to the lab, perform the experiment and you do not see them. That is exactly what happened to Stokes. Sir G. G. Stokes, who is uh, associated with the development of Navier-Stokes equation. So, he solved uh, flow past uh, inside a pipe and uh, tried to compare his analytical solution with experimental data and he did not find anything. So, it does uh, mean uh, that not all solutions are observable, we can see them. So, this is one thing that has uh, really triggered uh, the attention of many people. So, that is what we want to study uh, in uh, instability of in fluid mechanics, because this is related to the instability of the solutions. What is instability? That if I have a solution or if I have a uh, physical uh, scenario, then if I uh, d also have some background disturbances, which is not in my control they do affect and instability implies those small imperceptible disturbances to create large effects. That is what we mean by instability. Small cause leads to large disturbances and there are uh, classical theories developed and you would be uh, quite amazed uh, if you have not heard of it before <coughs> that it was uh, one of the pioneer in physics who actually picked this problem up to solve and he is no other than uh, Heisenberg. Uh, as a student of Sommerfeld, he first started looking at flow instability uh, and subsequently the German school uh, led by uh, Professor Prandtl and his students actually started looking at it. Uh, two notable students are Tolman and Schlichting those of you have seen the book by Schlichting. So, this is the same gentleman, uh, they worked on it and what they found that uh, the flow becomes unstable uh, and then you also see some waves. So, this is what we mean by, uh, this is what you mean by uh, Heisenberg, Tolman, Schlichting waves that we have written there. We will we'll be spending quite a bit of time talking about that. <coughs> what is important uh, to realize that uh, Again, those theoretical prediction of instability theories are not to be seen in experiment. So, you can see that uh, as a engineer by training or as, as a scientist by training, you cannot uh, compartmentalize your activity. You cannot just simply say, I am a theoretician, I do not know, uh, I do not care about experiments. The same way experimentalists cannot make the same claim that we do experiments, if we do not see it, then your theory is wrong. This happens all the time, it is unfortunate business and to tell you in this context also similar thing happened. 
when this uh, three people uh, one after the other started predicting these waves, it was nobody uh, else other than Professor G. I. Taylor of Cambridge. He tried to experiment. And when he uh, tried to perform those experiments, he did not see those waves. And so, that led to a sort of a very big debate, international debate. The German school is saying that there are waves and the English school led by J. I. Taylor says there are no waves. So, what happens? That is what uh, is a big story. Then uh, came into the picture is this group from USA, uh, Dryden and his colleagues. Two of his uh, colleagues, uh, Schubauer and Scramstad, uh, did perform some classic experiments at National Bureau of Standard in Washington. They did those experiments and they were the first to observe those waves. And to perform those experiments, they had to work very hard. They realized that not all kinds of disturbances give rise to waves. So, as a mathematician all, always, you would see like people talk about flow instability in terms of eigenvalue problem. Hmm? So, eigenvalue problem is what? You have a homogeneous equation, homogeneous boundary condition and you try to get a solution out of it and those are your eigen solutions. So, what does it mean actually? It means as if uh, something is falling from the heaven, you are not putting any effort and you are seeing some results. right? So, that is another drawback of eigenvalue analysis. What one should instead look at is connect the cause with the effect. So, cause will be those background disturbances. They may not be always measurable, but they still would have some quality and that is what Schubauer and Scramstad found out. Schubauer and Scramstad noted that not all disturbances produce waves. They could produce waves only when they vibrated a ribbon inside the boundary layer. They found out that if you try to excite the flow with acoustic noise, it does not create waves. And that is the subject that we talk about in this, what we call as receptivity. That the flow is receptive to certain class of disturbances. Not all disturbances can give you instability waves. Okay. So, if we are going to do that, we need to actually instead of studying stability, we should be studying receptivity. And that is a major thrust in this course, perhaps uh, unique uh, in all over the world that this subject is addressed in that framework. We do it here. So, we will be talking about receptivity and <coughs> what we would also notice that um, this experiment that was done by Schubauer and Scramstad required extreme care in setting this experiment up. You have to create a virtually a noise free background, reduce the disturbance as far as possible. So, they actually designed a very, very nice wind tunnel. That wind tunnel even 70 years afterwards continued to be used somewhere in some US universities. So, you have to design a wind tunnel. You would find that there would be many experimental facilities, they make unsubstantiated claim that we have a very noise free tunnel, but they have no measurement of noise though. Well, we will not talk about that. Uh, what we are going to talk about is the reality, not the virtual one where people make tall claims you really have to design a tunnel where background disturbances have brought down to 0. And then only you have to excite the flow deterministically like as I told you in Schubauer's Kranstad experiment that inside the boundary layer you started vibrating a ribbon. What happens if uh, the amplitude of that vibration becomes very large? You do not see those waves. You do not see those waves. So, what happens is any transition, any instability and transition that takes the flow from a laminar state to turbulent state without showing the waves have been historically called in the literature as bypass transition. So, it bypasses the route of 
that Heisenberg Tolman Schlichting waves, right. This is what we would be studying. <coughs> then um, people also uh, have realized that uh, there are a large number of cases where uh, your stability analysis shows the flow to be unstable, but in reality those flow also become turbulent. There are no flows which remain laminar forever. So, please do understand that laminar flow is an exception, turbulent flow is a rule. Okay. Unfortunately, bias in all the programs is to pretend as if laminar flow is everything and turbulent flow is a specialization. It is not true. People should know turbulent flow more than they should know about laminar flows, uh, but to even to know how the turbulent state appears, you need to know this process of transition from laminar to turbulent. That is precisely what we are doing in this course. right? <coughs> uh, what happens is as I told you that there are many uh, flow situations where you would not see these waves, it is bypassed etcetera and there are also cases where the instability theory even says that it would not become unstable and uh, nothing uh, 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 more to uh, exemplify this is the case of a let us say pi flow. Theoretically it is shown to be stable, but we all know that a Reynolds number above 2000 based on diameter of the pipe flow becomes turbulent. Then there is a squared flow shear driven right. If I have flow between two parallel plates and the top plate is moving that is what we call as a quad flow. Quad flow is also theoretically found to be stable. Right? However, those flows are not really stable. So, people have tried to study one of the mechanism people talk about is some kind of spatio temporal instabilities um, that may be affecting some of these flows and this is what we are trying to look at. Okay. <coughs> Uh, this is about wall bounded flows, external flows that we have been talking about because most of us have a background of aerospace engineering. So, we are more, more interested in external flows, but then we also at times have to worry about not streamlined shape, we have to worry about bluff shape. Think of an aircraft when the landing gear comes out, it is a flow past a cylinder. right? Uh, well, there are many, many such occasions you would see there are cavities etcetera. So, there what happens is we do not have uh, streamlined body flows, instead we have blood body flows and they also suffer some kind of an instability. Okay. Now, instability per se, instability per se can also occur in two different ways or a combination of these two ways. What are these two ways? the disturbances can grow in space, disturbances can grow in time and disturbance can also grow in space and time. That is what we talked about spatio temporal instability, disturbances which simultaneously grow in space and time. Now, uh, this uh, earlier part external flows that we talked about past streamline bodies, one of the characteristic feature people have noticed over the years is that there the disturbances actually convect as they grow. That means, it is a spatial growth, growth in space. Okay. In contrast to that, let us say flow past a cylinder is looked at, a blood body flow. There you notice that initially the disturbances grow in time. If you are positioned in the wake, you look at it, you will see it grows in time. Now, it is an interesting thing that uh, that is a that is a basically a sort of a evidence of instability, the disturbances are growing, but nonlinearity plays a very different role for this external flows or past a streamlined body and a blob body. For a streamlined body what happens? The nonlinearity actually accentuates, increases the instability, that is where you go. Please do not understand uh, uh, make this uh, misconception that uh, flow becomes unstable and boom it becomes turbulent. It does not happen that way. The instabilities grow, then 
that disturbed flow further can become unstable. So, the first instability we will call it as a primary instability, the subsequent ones we will call it as secondary instability, tertiary instability and so on and so forth. So, for a streamlined body flows, the primary instabilities are predicted very nicely by those classical theories, while the secondary and the tertiary instabilities are due to some kind of nonlinear effects and they actually accentuate the instability. While for a flow past a blood body, we will show that the primary instability is a temporal instability and nonlinearity here plays a very interesting role. Nonlinearity here actually modulates, moderates the primary instability. So, the waves keeps growing, but then it saturates. Okay. We will see this, we will spend a lot of time doing this. So, these are some of the interesting things that we would be talking about and you have heard of Landau. Landau came out with a uh, equation which is called Stuart Landau equation uh, that tells you how this primary instability saturates into a nonlinear action into another almost neutral amplified waves. So, you start off from one equilibrium state that was your laminar flow, it became unstable because of temporal instability the nonlinearity saturates it. So, you actually get a time periodic flow. This is what you see as the vortex shedding behind a cylinder. That is a classic example that you have a vortex shedding, Carmen uh, Bernard vortex shedding uh, behind a cylinder. You say that they are very periodic, they do not just simply explode. That happens due to this nonlinear action and Landau actually worked out the equation for it. And we will also talk about bifurcation. What is bifurcation? Now, we are talking about instability of flows. As I told you, flow inside a pipe, the classical linear theory says it is stable. But if I perform experiment, I find that flow cannot be kept easily laminar if the Reynolds number is above 2000. If it is above 2000, then you will have to make some effort, additional effort to keep the flow laminar. But if your Reynolds numbers are less than 2000, then even if you uh, create a lot of disturbance in that flow, it still remains laminar. So, it seems the Reynolds number works like a kind of a parameter for the problem and you have a critical value below which it remains stable, above which it is unstable. So, this kind of a scenario where actually we may look at uh, let us say flow past a cylinder, if I were to be talking about on this axis, I will be plotting say Reynolds number based on the diameter. And on this side, let me just simply a plot the amplitude. So, basically what we are talking about that uh, um, we are going to get some disturbances. Okay. So, this let me write it as u d subscript d implying disturbance field and that I will write it as some A of t. I told you it suffers from a temporal instability. So, let us call that as A of t and that would be multiplied by some function of space f of x. Right? Now, this is that A that we are plotting, the time dependent. What we find that up to some Reynolds number, that um, up to that the flow remains laminar. That means what? This amplitude does not die. So, you, if, even if you create some disturbance, that disturbance will eventually decay. 
So, this is something like your equilibrium flow. Okay. What do we mean by this? So, what we can do is if I plot a of t versus uh, t, I may get something like this. That initially, let us say I create some kind of a disturbance. And if I am below this RE critical, critical value, then what will happen? It may just simply go and go on and decay. That is subcritical flow, right. So, this is the subcritical part. Okay. And this part I will call it as supercritical. So, this is your a subcritical solution where you may have initially created some disturbances at t equal to 0, but eventually decays. Whereas, in case of a supercritical case, uh, what happens is uh, something different happen. Um, there, what we will find that suppose I start off with some virtually no disturbance at all, but there are background disturbances in the experimental facility. Then what will happen for a supercritical scenario, I would have something like this. I will show you detailed uh, results of this theoretical, computational as well as experimental. People have done it and they really find that something very interesting thing happen. It remains virtually like this. Then you actually see some kind of a very high frequency oscillations uh, once in a while and then it slowly picks up. So, this is what we meant by uh, blood body flow instability and then what happens is it just saturates to in an envelope. And this growth of the amplitude curve is what is of interest. So, in the supercritical case what happens is you are going to see that starting from RE critical this is your equilibrium state. So, this is my A e that we are talking about. This is uh, that A e the amplitude it is 2 times right. It is a periodic oscillation. So, it is 2 times A e. So, I can plot that and what you would find that uh, the scenario is like this that uh, up to R e critical that equilibrium amplitude remains 0 and then it actually goes like this. So, this uh, behavior is typical of uh, blood body flows and uh, this transition from a subcritical to supercritical state is what is often called as bifurcation. Now, why, why, why do we call the solution bifurcation? It means that in the supercritical stage, I can actually get a solution which could be here or if I am carefully doing the experiment, I can also as you have this case. For example, for the pi flow experiment, we will talk about today itself time permitting. Osborne Reynolds did those experiments. We talked about just now a Reynolds number of 2000 being the critical Reynolds number. Osborne Reynolds number carefully did those experiments and he could keep the flow laminar all the way up to 12830. Okay. Nothing to be surprised about because later on people even uh, did experiments and created pipe flow which were stable for a Reynolds number of 100000. So, what it means that uh, your solution bifurcates from this point onwards. Here you will only have one solution, but here you will have multiplicity of solutions. Okay. Well, this is a very, very uh, typical attribute of uh, uh, systems which uh, suffer temporal instabilities 
uh, specially flow past blood bodies, you can think about. So, this kind of uh, bifurcation is uh, uh, what is called as a hop bifurcation. Well, there are many types of bifurcation, hop bifurcation is one of it. So, we will we'll use that and um, we will also talk about uh, the other interesting things like effect of heat transfer around flow instabilities. This is a very, very important issue, because if we are talking about let us say flow past flow in our atmosphere, the weather system, here uh, what you have? You cannot just simply talk about the instability of the atmosphere only in the absence of heat transfer. The heat transfer as it occurs, sun is our main source of energy, but we these days we are also creating lot of uh, heat ourselves, right? Anthropogenic heat transfer, right? Man made heat. How does it affect the system dynamics? You got to understand that in this course, we are going to take a very, very deterministic approach of systems in studying their instability. So, what we are going to talk about is uh, basically a system which I would represent by a let us say a black box. So, this is your system right. Now, what happens to the system? The system is bombarded by input. We like it or not, they are there. That is what we have been studying, right? And then we get an output. And we have already seen the talking about receptivity is basically trying to connect input with the output through the system dynamics. What is the system dynamics? Okay. For the time being, I will call that as the transfer function. So, what does this uh, system do? It takes the input, multiplies it by the transfer function to give you an output. Transfer function is then the property of the system. So, I can have uh, flow power in the weather system. Uh, without the heat transfer, I am talking about one kind of transfer function. The moment I add the heat transfer, the transfer function has changed. This is what I was telling you also about Reynolds experiment. He did something to change the transfer function or he did something to reduce the input. Right? So, there are lots of very, very interesting thing in studying any dynamical system. This is basically is one of the goal of this course that we talk about systems in nature as a dynamical system. Talk about the economics of a country, it is a dynamical system. right? We do not know how to model it, we cannot uh, get its transfer function correctly, that is a different issue, but hopefully in future we should be able to do that. Look at all those smart Alex in the finance field. They actually play around, find out how those micro fluctuations in the input and they convert it into dollars in their pocket. Right? That is also they study, they use chaos dynamics. Right? So, we talk about this. Any practical system tells you that uh, this transfer function need not always be very deterministic. Very good example is, as I always uh, am fond of quoting, is tossing a coin. We cannot even predict its transfer function. Why? Well, I mean that's a part philosophic, part physical. But uh, the fact is, we do not know what are the players that determine the outcome. Right? Uh, the same way, economics. As a subject, 
We do not know. There are too many contributing factors that makes the study of that dynamical system very, very difficult. You cannot get a, a deterministic portrait of it. We have to talk about it as a stochastic system and that happens. The stochastic system means what? It is probabilistic, but also time dependent. That is stochastic, right? Tossing a coin could be a probabilistic event. But we do not know whether it is stochastic or not. Because if I am doing the experiment in this room tossing a coin, uh, depending on how the temperature inside the room is changing with time, etcetera, or if I keep a windows open or something and the air dri drips in, that can all affect the outcome of the experiment. So, whether it is simple probabilistic time independent or it is time dependent that is stochastic, we do not know. So, basically um, in terms of uh, instabilities as affected by heat transfer is a, a worthy subject that gives us a, some glimpse of what may happen to a complex system. We will be talking about that and then I will uh, talk about secondary and three dimensional instabilities back to our aerospace uh, applications where we will see uh, how this uh, secondary and the three dimensional instabilities come into play. And I told you very clearly about this aspect instabilities and transition. Instability does not mean that you would get a transition immediately, right. So, basically instability and transition are not synonymous. You have a finite region over which the flow becomes unstable. So, if I am studying a flow past a aerofoil, so the flow can become critical at this stage, but if I am looking at say fully turbulent state, it may have happened here. So, this is what I may call as a critical point and this is where let us say finally, the transition takes place. Well, there are various definitions of transition quantifiable. So, let us say we adopt one of those and that says it is there. So, this is a very non-trivial space. So, this is what we will be calling it as the transitional flow. So, on this side we have laminar flow. and on this side we have turbulent flow and these two are bridged by transitional flow, right. So, it so happens that this region over which transition occurs is not trivial. A very good example would be a flow in a turbine, in a gas turbine. You know in a turbine flow accelerates accelerate means it is under the influence of favorable pressure gradient, while that turbine also sits downstream of the combustion chamber. And combustion through those all those chemical reaction makes the flow very, very dirty, very, very noisy. So, you have a competing dialogue going on. You have a dirty flow coming in bombarding and you are imposing a acceleration which is trying to moderate that makes this region very, very significantly large. So, to understand transitional flow is a very, very important issue and that is what we need to really uh, keep uh, aware of and once you come to the turbulent state, you need to know what is really turbulent flow. And I would uh, time permitting, I will talk about this morphology, what constitutes. In this course, we are not doing turbulence modeling. I mean, we, 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 we would keep that aside, we will we'll focus on the scientific aspect of it, we will we'll talk about it. See, uh, basically all we want to do eventually try to understand what is turbulent flow. Hmm? So, we have taken a different route now to in understanding this. We are coming from the laminar flow side and see where we are. Our point of view is that the turbulent state where we had arrived would be determined by the process of transition. 
it is not unique. Okay. Uh, now, we have seen uh, what our course of content is going to be like. Uh, this, this is something you must uh, be also curious to know, what are the references that we are going to use. Well, we are going to use this book. This is a book that uh, myself and uh, uh, Dr. Poinso have written. Uh, we will not do the chemical reaction part, we will just uh, do this part instability of flows with and without heat transfer. Right? So, this uh, book is uh, available. Apart from that book, uh, uh, I would recommend that one uh, looks at uh, this book by Drazin and Reed. It is now uh, quite a classic uh, book uh, titled Hydrodynamic Stability. And this two will be more than adequate. There are many other books. You can take a look at them, but it is not uh, necessary. Okay. So, we will uh, stick to these two books only and that should be adequate. And in the turbulent flow part, uh, we have a very nice book here, uh, first course in turbulence by Tenekis and Lumley. Uh, that is uh, one book that we would be uh, using in bits and pieces. Uh, but for understanding the morphology of turbulent flow, we would also be looking at uh, this applied analysis of the Navier-Stokes equation by Dwering and Gibbon. Uh, this is a very short monograph, but very nice book, nice book. And uh, as we seen and discussed uh, that we like to study the flow as a dynamical system and we try to find out uh, what its transfer function etcetera is. So, that uh, is covered very nicely in this book uh, called Turbulence, Coherent Structure, Dynamical Systems and Symmetry. So, Holmes and Lumley and Barkus, they have written this exceedingly nice book. Our interest is to basically characterize turbulent flow by some diagnostic tools of dynamical system theory. One of the dynamical system theory tools that we are going to use time and again is proper orthogonal decomposition. Uh, let me tell you the good news that that tool was developed by Professor D. D. Kosambi of India. Despite all the things that you read in literature, it was Professor Kosambi who did that, published in a paper, Indian Journal in 1943. Karhun and Loeb and all other people came later. Uh, so, there is something we are going to use the POD as a tool, proper orthogonal decomposition in trying to understand. You see, turbulent flow may look chaotic, but still within that chaos also still you would see some pattern. right? Uh, those patterns are what are called as coherent structures. So, this was what was uh, attempted. So, POD as a tool allows you to project that stochastic system into a deterministic basis and see whether you can pick up those coherent structure or not. That is what we are going to spend quite a bit of time. In fact, uh, many of the students who work with us, with me, they do uh, use POD as a tool and we have done some very, very interesting thing in recent years using POD. So, we will we'll do that. And there is also this book uh, by Professor Davidson uh, titled Turbulence. It is a fairly a recent book and you would uh, find it uh, interesting. Okay. Uh, this is something that uh, be, would, would be of interest to you that we will only have one mid-send. Okay. We will have a uh, comprehensive end -send, which will cover the whole course. And uh, I'll ask you to do a bit of a, a term project, etc. Uh, that would be 25 percent, and the small home assignments, your regularity, etc. Will take care of this rest 10 percent. Okay. <coughs> so we'll be uh, uh, following this, and uh, this is the way that we would be doing. Now this we already have started. We have uh, told you, but still uh, nonetheless we see how the subject of uh, transition have developed over the years. Now, <clears throat> I told you about Reynolds experiment, but it was not Reynolds who started this investigation. Rather, I mentioned you to you about those pipe flow experiment uh, means calculations done by Stokes and his inability to see those experiments. Uh, mm -hmm experimental 
values obtained by his theoretical analysis. What was the anomaly? Simply Stokes was looking at his laminar flow calculations, while the experimental results for the pi flows, they are for turbulent flows. People were thinking, what is happening? I mean, what is this turbulent state? So, that um, really uh, set into motion a lot of work um, that is uh, embedded in a work of Kelvin, Raleigh, etcetera. They understood that instabilities are due to growth of disturbances. Hmm? That is very fine, I mean, that is what we are all talking about, but they make a cardinal mistake they said it is a inviscid mechanism. Raleigh even found out an equation to show how an inviscid mechanism comes about. He gave some theorems and criteria to find out when flow becomes uh, unstable. Now, they also made this observation that why one should look at the inviscid mechanism. Their point of view was very simply this, that if viscous action is there, it is dissipative. right? So, if there is some kind of a dissipative mechanism, that will actually damp out those disturbances. So, it is perfectly all right for us to study the inviscid mechanism, because if there are any viscous actions, they will only attenuate disturbances. This looks very convincing, compelling to follow, right? But then there are other people, mathematician and physicist, who are not thoroughly convinced. Two of them, a mathematician by name Orr and physicist named Sommerfeld, they actually wrote down the disturbance equations, including the viscous action. And that equation is called the orr sommerfeld equation. This orr sommerfeld equation is a central piece today, but in those days, nobody thought that uh, that was necessary, because I told you that the viscous action only attenuates disturbance. So, there are absolutely no need for adding in co complication to the viscous action. right? <coughs> Despite that, Heisenberg under the guidance of Sommerfeld wrote his PhD dissertation and he did uh, try to say what could happen. That thesis was very unique. The examination committee looked at the thesis, they could not find any mistake but they did not also believe it. And that is the story of how quantum mechanics came into being. Uh, Heisenberg after his thesis stopped working on fluid flow and he went on to establish quantum mechanics. So, you, you understand that uh, this subject uh, has a very checkered history. Uh, while uh, Sommerfeld was a brilliant researcher, four of his students uh, received a Nobel Prize, he never got it. right? So, that is another story. Uh, subsequently, uh, also uh, well along the same time, around the same time, uh, Ludwig Prandtl and his students also were interested looking at uh, this instability problem. And I told you about those experiments, uh, sorry, those calculations done by Tolman and Schlichting. They did come out with some uh, results but those were again negated by G. I. Taylor's experiment in Cambridge. He never could found it out, well, because Taylor did not read those results, uh, analytical results very carefully. They predicted wave for certain frequencies and in the Taylor's experiment, he used a sort of a bump, oscillating bump on a flat plate but the bump was oscillating at a wrong frequency, low frequency. And believe me, in almost in 95 or 96, 
we explain really what happened in those Taylor's experiments. So, it took another 60 years to come out to the, it was done here uh, by one of the, our, couple of our students. Uh. So, if you try to excite a flow at a lower frequency and you do not see it, do not kill the messenger, right. Unfortunately, everybody did. Uh, but then around the same time, Dryden and his group at uh, National Bureau of Standard did those experiments that I, we already discussed. That Schubert Scrabstad experiments, they figured out that to investigate and obtain those uh, waves, you will have to remove the background disturbances and then give some kind of a deterministic disturbances of finite amplitude. Then your dynamical system picture is quite nicely constructed, right. You have a very definitive input and you know the laminar flow that is your transfer function and you try to find out what is your output going to be, those disturbance growing. And that actually helped the subject tremendously, those classic experiments done by Schubert and Scrabster. So, this was really the defining moment and uh, despite what is written in um, any book and many book, I would always refer to it as Heisenberg Tolman Schristing waves. So, I will call it as HTS waves, but you will find in most of the literature they talk about TS wave. We should give Heisenberg his credit. In fact, he was one of the pioneer in this field. Okay. <coughs> Uh, they obtained all those waves using a linearized stability theory. They made some assumption of parallel flows. Despite that, they did predict those waves and Schubert, Scramstad found those out in experiments. So, this was a glorious uh, period. Okay. <coughs> and I mentioned to you also th that there were many flows, pipe flows, channel flows, square flows that uh, did not uh, explain the flow instability by the same linearized uh, stability theory developed there. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know we are happy to give excuses, right. So, people gave excuses that may be these are the suspects, nonlinearity because it was a linear theory. So, may be some nonlinear mechanism is taking place. Then, uh, the flow was considered parallel in this theory. Parallel means what? The streamlines are parallel, but you know a boundary layer grows, so the, they do not remain parallel. right? So, that is that. Uh, that uh, growth part is important, non-parallelism and maybe there are other unknown mechanisms. Okay? So, even today a large number of us try to spend time finding out some new unknown mechanisms. Okay? So, there are lots of uh, such activities that goes on, but it was realized. So, I think I will uh, stop here and we will start from here in the next class.